though you wrote this book uh, with your grandmother. I think that must be, there must be a story behind this. There definitely is. My grandmother was a mentor of mine. She was so special. She gave advice, not in a way that was pushy or presumptuous. It was tactical, logical, and it worked. And I actually worked on the index to the original version of this book with her over 25 years ago. How old were you? Just a little. <laughs> it was a little thing, and it was it was so refreshing to be able to take this book and revise and modernize it for today's world. When my grandmother wrote the book over 25 years ago, she did not uh, include things like narcissism, passive aggressiveness, handling work-life balance issues, dealing with a boss who's 20 years your junior. Those things weren't around back then, but a lot of the common sense information was still applicable and is, and so I approached the publisher and I asked if I might revise and modernize the book. And when they said yes, I was so thrilled because it not only helps to add to her legacy, but it was a very special and meaningful project for me uh, because she's the person who actually introduced me to the field of industrial organizational psychology. When I was thinking of going into clinical psychology or law, she's the one who cut out a newspaper clipping and said, this is the great field to, to apply. And by the way, industrial organizational psychology is a mouthful, and it, it, deal, it is dealing with uh, people in the workplace in general. It's uh, helping employees and employers to get along better, improve like, workplace communication, motivation, work-life balance. And those are things that are very special to me, and interestingly, were really special to my grandmother as well. We live in the most politically charged time in this country, it seems. Um, how does somebody who works in an office and is constantly being just, you know, inundated with people wanting to know, what did you think of this person? What did you think of the president? How do you deal with that? We need to distinguish between our interactions with people who are our friends and our interactions with people at work. I like to call them friends versus friend leads. People who we work with are not necessarily our friends. In fact, most of them are not. We don't need to impress them. We don't need to interact with them at a particular level or engage in dialogue that we're not interested in doing if it does not directly relate to work. So we need to take emotion out of the situation. If we are very upset about something happening politically or we perhaps don't care, we need not interact and engage in that dialogue unless we work in a political office. Then we would. But if it's not related to politics and we work in a different industry, then we simply need to say, if it's not related to the business, let's step aside and get our work done. And we can say so by saying, thank you so much for asking me this question. You know, actually, I'm, I'm, I'm tight on a deadline right now, so I'm happy to chat about this with you during our coffee break or at lunch. But right now, I need to get back to work. And Amy, how about if they don't abide by that? How about if they're, they're trying to goad you just into, they really want to know how you feel about a certain situation and they're not going to let it go? We need to lead by example. If I do not want to discuss politics, then I need to simply stand up and say, I'm, on, I'm moving on to my next thing. If someone comes into my office and I'm busy working and, oh, did you see the most recent? Then simply stand up and walk away. Have a great day. I've, I've got to run to here. I've got to run to the meeting. If they follow you to the water cooler, then you simply say, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm on a tight deadline. I'm not interested in discussing this. I ha I'm happy to chat, but it has to be work-related. I'm on a really tight timeline. So we just have to continue to repeat this over and over again, and eventually they'll get the hint. Well, that's interesting. So in other words, it's just conditioning, uh, whether you're conditioning your, your employees or you're conditioning your boss. Sure. You know, this is, this is how I'm going to run my life. And you may not know it, but I'm going to show you how to do it. We need to right. set boundaries. And I think sometimes employees are concerned that they either will not be liked or that they will get in trouble if they don't participate in a particular dialogue. If my boss approaches me and says, oh, what do you think about this? And it's related to something political or otherwise, and I'm not interested, then if it's related to work, then I'll say, let's go on. But if it's not, then I might say, you know what, this is not for me right now. I'm really tight. I know that it's important to you. I know that it's important to the business that I complete this task on time. In order for me to be most productive, I can't engage in this type of dialogue now. It's direct. It's straight. It's clear. It's not rude. But it simply says, this is the boundary that I am setting, and I am not engaging in this dialogue. Amy, there's so many, uh, you know, when your, your grandmother wrote the book, Computers weren't big, email wasn't big, and nowadays so much is out there. How do you have time without having your boss constantly get in your face about being available? We need to set boundaries. And I think employees sometimes fear sharing their needs with their boss 
because someone else is willing to do everything and always be available. But we still need to say, in order for me to be most productive, here's what I need. I need to, I'm going to give you my all when I'm at the office, but I specifically chose this job because I really love the way that I see everyone is able to have a really great business life and then still have a home life. My family is important to me. I'm going to go to work and do my very, very best, but when I go home, I need to know that I can be with my family or I need to know that I can scoot out to, to do my other, even, some people are, are working or going to um, you know, some type of a school afterwards. They need to be able to do those things and so we need to clearly say what we need. I think in the office place, we are often afraid to communicate clearly and so what we do is we don't say anything at all. And it's better to be clear, direct, kind, positive, but affirmative. This is what I need. Can you give me an example of how I would say that, let's say to my boss, that, you know what, okay, if you keep sending me these emails, <coughs> I cannot, <coughs> every five seconds when I'm at home, keep responding to you. You know, what, what do I do? So something that I, I suggest is, boss, I appreciate that this is an urgent matter. I'm happy to work on it, however, I won't be able to check back in until nine o'clock tonight. Just so you know, if you're sending me texts and messages, I'll be busy until then, but I'm happy to, to check in at that point and reply as needed. Setting clear standards is really important. In certain industries, we have to always be available. We have to always be able to answer for a customer. But in other industries where we're able to truly take a break, it doesn't mean because of the way that this world is set up and we're in this fast food type environment where everyone has to always be available and responsive, we need to still show our boss that we can do so. But a tactic that works is to say, I need to, to take off right at five o'clock or 5.30 whenever our workday ends, however I commit to replying to any necessary messages at nine o'clock and then again when I first get back into the office. And you can even put an out of office on your email and let that and let the boss know, you know, or anyone else who's who's writing, I, I'm, you know, my office hours are, or if you write to me, I'll be sure to reply by. And those type of tactics are very, very effective.